Many thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. I'm looking forward to what I think will be a great conversation on a number of topics. And I do hope it will be a conversation. So I will be addressing questions to some of you in particular. But if the spirit so moves you and there's something that you would like to say, please feel free to jump in at any point. Uh, but with that, let's start um, and with a conversation about the judiciary as an institution. And Chief Justice Kinzer, I was wondering if we could start with you on this. Some commentators say that judges should never be influenced by their life experience or their political leanings when they come to the bench to decide cases. And other commentators say that it's impossible not to do that, that judges come to the bench with a lifetime of experience, and that necessarily is brought to bear on any decision that someone might make. Where do you fall on that spectrum? How do you, how do you assess those issues? I think that we are all products of our past experiences, our childhood, and the things that we have done and experienced throughout our lifetime. So to say that we come to the bench and can set all of that aside, no, I don't think that's true. I actually think I disagree with the statement that, that we can and should. But what I do think is that we, we need to come to the bench recognizing if we have any kind of biases or prejudices uh, and, and be able to set those aside in some respects, the same kind of thing that a juror is asked to do. But also I think that you cannot come to the bench with an agenda. Um, you have to look at each case and decide each case based upon the law and the facts. And that you should never use your past experiences and your life uh, time events to press forward an agenda that, to try to shape the law in a certain way or issues because of your um, ideology. So that you have to leave behind. But to say that we are not a product of our past experiences, I think is just not accurate. We are. Right. So Chief Justice Kinzer, if, I don't know if you share uh, Justice Lemon's view completely on that issue of the public perception of the court, but if you do, is there something that can be done about it? Are there ways in which the public can better understand the operation of the court? Well, I agree and share his views, but I would add to it that I think, and this is something I've come to learn um, very acutely as Chief Justice, is that the public really does not understand our system of government. I actually think we have missed a whole generation of people through civics education. Uh, I applaud Justice O'Connor, her I civics program that's wonderful. Because I've, I, the, the, the judiciary doesn't have an advocate. Um, and one legislator told me, that um, he doesn't have people calling him about the judiciary. His phone calls are about potholes. So I wish people were calling members of the General Assembly about the court, the inadequate funding, the lack of staffing, as often as they were calling them about potholes. So I, I really wish the public understood better that we're three separate independent branches and that at the end of the day, it is the judiciary that preserves the rule of law and that at the end of the day, it is the judiciary who protects our lives, liberty, and property. Uh, we are the ones who have the authority to say a statute is unconstitutional. It infringes one of your rights guaranteed to you under the Constitution. Um, and I don't think people realize that and appreciate it. So I would like to see more education of the public so that they become advocates. And I've become convinced that it ha has to happen on a grassroots level. You know, I, I go to the General Assembly and, and ask for funding and, and judicial uh, vacancies to be filled, but I need people going to them. The mom and pop who runs the store and can't get their case heard, uh, we need people like that going to the General Assembly and saying, the courts matter to me. There was a quote from, I think, Anthony Justice Scalia, I mean, not Scalia, Justice Kennedy, who said that, Courts are as important as schools and bridges, and I agree. But I'm not sure that members of the General Assembly do or that the public does, but they need to. So that's what I've found very troubling as Chief Justice. So we need to send you out on speaking tours, or uh, what is that? <laughs> I think I've been on a few, yes. probably. <laughs> but we're limited in what we can say and do. Mm -hmm. That's why I think we need help from just the average person, not just, yes, from the lawyers, but but from the non-lawyers too, and that we need to re-educate the people. Um, I think Abraham Lincoln said, if you educate the children, you don't have to educate the adults. But right now, I think we need to educate the adults 
and the children mm -hmm. about our system of government. And they need to understand, too, that we have a state system of courts mm -hmm. and a federal system and the differences between them. Uh, because I've had people come up to me and say, well, I'm going to take that case to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I'm thinking, no, you're not. It doesn't involve a federal issue or a constitutional issue of the U.S. Constitution. So we are the final um, arbitrators about that. We have the final say about state law and our state constitution. Unfortunately, at least in the press, in the national press, the federal courts get all the attention. Mm -hmm. State courts, whether it's in Virginia or elsewhere, do not get that much attention. But what people don't realize is that 95% of all cases in this country are filed in state court. And so the state courts are the ones who are truly impacting their lives. Yes, we need, we need a marketing company on this, yes. it sounds like. Oh, I, I read the appellant's brief, I read the appellee's brief, mm -hmm. I read the reply brief so that I fully understand what at least the parties think the issues are. In that and, order. In that order, mm -hmm. yes. And then I would go to the record. Uh, now, I'm not saying that, you know, I never go to the record in the process of that. Maybe there's, sure. maybe there's a letter opinion from the trial court, and after having read the appellant's brief, I really want to see what the trial court says, so I may stop and, you know, go there. So it depends on the case and what the issues are. Uh, the written memo that uh, Justice Millett referred to, I don't look at at this point. I mean, every I don't, should say never, but um, that's a condensed version of the issues that were presented at the petition stage. And I, I only look at that um, if I've read all the briefs and I feel like they, don't, they didn't tell me what this case is about. Maybe there's something in the written memo that will help me. Um, so I, I very seldom look at those once a case has been uh, granted an appeal by the court. Don't say never, but it's certainly the last thing I do. And after I've done all of that, I would then turn to um, research that my law clerks um, have given me or a bench memo that I might have asked them to do or do my own research. But um. Anybody start with the Appellee's Brief? No? Everybody starts at the beginning and works their way through? Yeah? I call it Cynthia's Stream of Consciousness. Because <laughs> I do the same thing. Uh -huh. It's my stream of consciousness after I've gone through everything and I dictate what I'm thinking at that point. It goes into my notebook for court week. My secretary types it up as well. And sometimes that what I eventually do is contrary to what those notes um, say, but it helps me prepare mm -hmm. for court week after I've read so many briefs. So it sounds like, Chief Justice, that you um, likewise have been maybe persuaded at argument to think about something you hadn't thought about before. Um, are you persuaded ever um, by the writing, by the force of the argument in the brief? So you, you look at the issues and you think, you know, perhaps approaching it with the same experience uh, that Justice Goodwin said, well, I know the law in this area, that seems like an uphill climb, and then you read the brief and the, the language, the strength of the argument, maybe gets you to see it a different way? Well, certainly the better the writing, mm -hmm. the better the uh, analysis in the brief, the more it helps me understand. And if you're helping me understand, then you're more likely to persuade me to that particular viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But it's not a good court contest, mm -hmm. so I'm not judging which brief or which oral argument is best. It doesn't mean that the person who wrote the best brief or presented the best oral argument is always going to win. Uh, that's frequently not the case, but it just the better the oral argument, the better the brief, the, be the more it helps me in coming to a decision and understanding the case and why I think a certain way. Are amicus briefs ever helpful to you, or how often are they helpful if they are? Probably half the time. Mm -hmm. uh, an amicus brief is good if it approaches it from a different viewpoint than that expressed by the appellant or appellee. But if the amicus brief is just repeating the arguments that have already been made by one side or the other, then it's not worth my time reading it. I mean, I read it, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it hasn't helped me because it hasn't told me anything new. It needs to tell me something new that I haven't thought about or that the other parties haven't addressed. So I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about um, the decision-making process at that point. Um, and uh, maybe, Chief Justice, I could start with you. Do you um, do you use your clerks to try to sort of think through some of the ideas? Do you exchange memos or, or emails uh, with your colleagues? Do you really kind of try to thrash it out at conference to, to reach a decision? How does the eventual opinion result from the, from the process? I think it depends on the case. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a fairly straightforward, simple case with perhaps just one or two issues, then it probably has been thrashed out, at least for me, before I ever get to oral argument. Um, that doesn't mean that in, in those cases that my mind not may, might not be changed in some way. But um, for me, when the opinion writing comes, you know, it's, it's sitting down and writing it based on 
what I've heard from my colleagues uh, at Opinion Conference and what my own thoughts are about it. Uh, writing a majority opinion is an interesting experience because for me personally, while I've got to reflect the views of at least three other people, if my name's on it, I'm not going to have anything in there that I don't agree with. And so there have been times when I've written an opinion that really was not um, the opinion that people probably thought I was going to write because I got into it and realized this doesn't work, it doesn't write. And so I may send them a memo when I circulate it that explains why I've gone down a different path and hope that at least three other people will agree with me after they've had to think, time to think about it. But in terms of the interchange and exchange of you know, information and memos between our colleagues, again, I think it depends on the case. Um, you know, if I'm, if I'm troubled about an issue and, and want to talk with a person, one of my colleagues, perhaps, you know, voice something at an opinion conference and I want to explore that with them a little bit, I may call them, I may email them or whatever. Um, and then sometimes after an opinion is circulated, some of us may circulate a memo to maybe first to the author or just call them. Um, and then it might go to the whole court. It just, it just depends. Um, so do you ever actually regroup? Uh, so if you have an opinion that didn't write, and so now you think, well, we have to change direction here a little bit to make this work. Will you have a second conference to talk about the issues? Oh, we do. I mean, mm -hmm. I, we have a conference in the afternoon after we've heard oral arguments. Mm -hmm. And then five weeks later, after we've had writ panels, we have what we call an opinion conference. And by then, we have circulated those opinions to each other that we've written from the last court week. And uh, we talk about them and get each other's comments. Um, the first, I'll never forget the first opinion conference that I attended. That, after, that evening, there was a dinner. And I saw um, a, a, one of my colleagues, who was a senior justice at the time, and he said, well, did you have your baptism today? And I said, yes, I did, indeed. <laughs> So it's very interesting the comments that you get from your colleagues from, you know, you need a comma here or you don't need a comma there, to very substantive suggestions about the opinion and changes that should be made. So that's the primary regrouping time. And then after that, we would circulate these revised opinions to each other again. And then we actually talk about them again, you know, via email and on Monday of court week. So when you are surprised by a more substantive suggestion, where does that come from? Is it because you perhaps didn't have the sense you thought you had about your colleague's position on a case before that time? Or there's been a change of thinking about the case? What, what do you think causes that surprise when a comment comes in that you weren't expecting? Oh, I, I don't think most of the comments that come in are, are probably things that I have been expecting. Um, I mean, but sometimes they may have a suggestion, a way to improve upon how I've presented a particular issue. Uh, you know, we welcome all of them. Um, but I don't know that there are too many comments that come that I didn't have some sense of, perhaps, from the discussions at opinion conference I've, you know, in the afternoons after we've heard the cases. A absolutely. Uh, I mean, I've, at this point, I've been on the court longer than anyone else here, um, which says something about my age, I guess. But um, I remember very well being told when I started on the court that you, you talk about the cases after you've heard oral argument in the morning and you haven't talked to anybody about them before that and once the opinion comes from your colleagues, you know, that what they've written, you don't offer any comment back to them about it until you come together again that fifth week I was talking about. Um, and so you were often blindsided by very substantive questions, comments, and you're just like, you're, tr you're struggling to remember what your thought process for why you wrote it that way, whereas if it comes earlier, you've had a chance to think about it. And I remember so well the first time that I dared to send a comment to one of my colleagues before the opinion conference, and I had found a case that I thought would really help the opinion, and I wanted to offer it to him, and so I sent him an email and did not know whether I would incur his wrath or not. But he never, he, he, he put it in the opinion. At opinion conference said, you know, Cynthia offered this to me and I think she, it was a good suggestion and I've incorporated it. And you, you could have knocked me over because I didn't know <laughs> what the reaction was going to be. But it was good. And I think slowly um, that has changed. And I think it's a good change. 
more collaborative yes. process <clears throat> because of necessity. It's the opinion of, of the court, and so even though it's authored in most cases by a particular justice. Well, my opinion, my name was never on it. How so? <laughs> because in the first paragraph, I give the litigants the answer. So you don't bury the leads right up front. Now, in the first paragraph, which I usually write last, I try to, as, in as few words as possible, state with the at least primary issue or all the issues are whatever and say and for these reasons we're going to affirm reverse whatever it is so that they can in the first paragraph know the bottom line without turning to the last page mm -hmm. and I think I'm the only person who does that so that's a dead giveaway for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the opinion issues Chief Justice um, have there been times where you would look back on an opinion that you've authored for the court um, and wish you'd phrase something differently? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it happens when you see how either attorneys or a trial court has taken the opinion and interpreted it. And based upon the language that you use, perhaps they are interpreting in a way that you know was not what you intended. And so you think, wow, I could have said that more clearly. And it's not unusual law to, at all to, to stop at the, you know, at the end of the day and realize you've spent an entire day trying to get one sentence or one paragraph the way you want it to make it clear. Um, so yes, there are times when you've used words, had sentences that you regret, they come back to haunt you. Does that influence how you approach the task going forward or that's simply part of the game and it's going to happen every once in a while regardless? It's, it's part, of, part of the job we have, um, but I think because of that potential at least it causes me to try to write as narrowly as possible and to not leave a lot of room for um, interpretation that may be not accurate because of language that I've used or said too much. Um, so I think I try to write narrowly. Does that ever enter your decision making process when a party files a petition for rehearing? Because I've written it narrowly? Because the petition might cause you to look at the language that was used in the first opinion and, and think about its implications that, that hadn't That has occurred. happened, and there have been a few occasions I can recall in the past 17 mm -hmm. years where someone might raise something in a petition for rehearing, and you look at the opinion and go, oops. And we've actually, you know, not actually granted the petition for rehearing, but we've withdrawn the opinion and taken out a footnote. I remember an opinion where I took a footnote out because the petition for rehearing was like, like, oh yeah, I should not have included that, and I took it out. So it, that happens, sure. Who has used a question at oral argument to actually talk to one of your colleagues, as opposed to I, yeah. who hasn't? <laughs> who hasn't? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Chief Judge <laughs> Justice, can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Um, if I'm unhappy with the way the tone of the questioning is going, I am not against, and have done frequently interject a question to try to get the attention of my colleagues. Um, I have to change the tone of the conversation yes, a little bit. Or to, or to realize that, that perhaps the questioning is going in a direction that I don't agree with mm -hmm. and the unfortunately the attorney is not able to turn it around and so I, you know I want to get the whole issue on the table. Mm -hmm. I want my colleagues to think about this in a different way. They may not change their mind mm -hmm. but I want to make sure it's fully developed wide variety of uh, arguments, I think. Uh, Chief Justice, are there, uh, is there advice you would give to the, the new advocate, or maybe even the experienced advocate? I think to all of them, I agree with Justice Millett, listen and be prepared. I don't care how eloquent you are, um, nothing takes the place for being prepared. If you're prepared, then you can bounce between issues. You can, you know, uh, answer questions and go down the, a different path than perhaps the path that you had hoped you'd be able to follow in your argument. Um, it's an intimidating situation. So, you know, I would tell them, you know, take a deep breath and, and we're there not to trick you, but we're there to have a conversation with you and to better understand your case. This is your opportunity to talk to us about it. And so um, that would be my advice. But, but, but listen and be prepared. So even the, the best prepared advocate will make the occasional mistake. So how does the court respond, Chief Justice, to those mistakes? So let me give you a, a hypothetical. Uh, 
an advocate, uh, there's a question about whether an issue has been properly preserved for appeal, let's say. Uh, and the advocate misstates whether it has or hasn't. In fact, the advocate says, Your Honor, I, I believe actually we did not properly preserve that for appeal, when in fact it had been. Would the court's inclination be to accept that concession, which of course would then eliminate an issue in the case, or to recognize that it was an error at argument and consider the issue? Well, you can't concede legal questions because we, we get to decide those. So only factual questions, perhaps, would we hold them to a, a factual concession. But if we recognize that they just were confused by what they were saying and made a mistake, because we've seen that, they, they, they misspoke what they meant, we don't hold them to that. We recognize that. Uh, and if it's a true concession, and if it's about an error preservation issue, I mean, we're going to go make up our own minds about that because that, you know, it's an interpretation of our rules given the facts of that case. Um, so I, I, we don't hold them to things that are pure mistakes, no. Or at least I don't think we do. The pressures of time and the frustration, but as Justice Millett just uh, mentioned, there are a lot of wonderful things about the job as well, and a lot of very fulfilling things. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that aspect of the job. I think the most fulfilling thing for me has been the incredible people with whom I've had the pleasure of sitting. All of these colleagues and all of those others who are not here now that I've had the opportunity to sit with are just incredibly wonderful, extremely intelligent, caring people. You know, we're friends, but um, just the all that we do for each other and the ways in which we challenge each other each and every day to not only be better people, but to be better jurists. Uh, it, it's just an incredible, court is an inc incredible place to work. Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity and it's, it's, it's just an incredible job. It, Justice Millett is right, it is all consuming, you're never away from it, um, but um, the rewards are make up for the, the cost. Well, I think that's a perfect note on which to end. So. Thank you so much to all of you for taking the time to have a conversation with us this afternoon. We really enjoyed it, uh, and thank you very much.